Hello, my name is Peter Bosman and I'm a senior researcher in the Life Science and Health Group of CWI. Today I want to talk to you about the vision of evolutionary intelligence. The first question of course is, what is evolutionary intelligence? The definition that I use is artificial intelligence that employs evolutionary algorithms. Now artificial intelligence is a very popular term nowadays that's open to many different definitions and interpretations, but to make sure we're on the same page I'll give you my definition. To me, AI is more or less algorithms that exhibit intelligent behavior. As a computer scientist, I like to think in terms of algorithms as they can be used to compute things on a computer. Often, uh, they have a natural or nature-inspired paradigm for if nature is considered to be intelligent, then algorithms that are based on mechanisms we, we see in nature are somehow artificially intelligent. Now, the paradigm that underlies evolutionary algorithms is that of natural evolution. And the main question is, how does natural evolution establish complex life forms? Because obviously that's been a very complicated uh, thing to do. And if we can understand the main mechanisms that led to this, maybe we can use that to solve complex optimization problems in computer science and mathematics. Um, of course, to make sure uh, this is not a tutorial on evolutionary algorithms, to make sure you have some understanding of what EAs do, I have a few slides. So consider two um, variables, x0 and x1, and a response surface that looks like this. I want to find the lowest point for x0 and x1 that, uh, in this, in this uh, response curve. On the right-hand side here, I have a heat map that basically says the same thing. Or, uh, purple here are our lower areas, and black are the lowest areas, and yellow are the highest areas. And this point here corresponds to this point here. Now, an evolutionary algorithm has three main ingredients. First of all, it has a population and not a single search point, so it spreads many points in the search space. Then it has a means of doing selection, meaning you can discard solutions that are not so good and select those that are above average or uh, better. And then a means of doing variation, taking those better solutions and turning them into even better solutions by combining them one way or another, reusing their uh, advantageous traits, if you will, and improving on them. And then we repeat. And this is an actual evolutionary algorithm running here on the screen right now, trying to find the lowest point in the search space. And this is actually even a multimodal evolutionary algorithm capable of finding all local optima in the search space in a single run, which it can do by virtue of using a population and spreading that population over the search space. Um, indeed, it's very much like breeding sheep. You know, if you have the traits that you want amplified, you select on that trait and you recombine based on that trait so you get uh, more and more sheep with darker and darker wool, if you will. Um, now, why would we want to study these evolutionary algorithms? What is their main reason for not using other techniques? Well, if you talk about optimization, you are quick to maybe draw something like this, a hill, we want to get to the top of the hill, but real world problems typically don't look like this. They are much more, um, well, nasty, if you will. They have much more noise, numeric instabilities, discontinuities, local optima, they look much more like the red line. And now to find the optimum in this search space is much more difficult, which is a uh, reason why I like evolutionary algorithms so much, because by virtue of that population, by introducing mechanisms that can actually cope with all of this, you can solve problems like this much more reliably and still find high quality solutions uh, for problems that even look like this. The other thing that evolutionary algorithms are really good at is multi-objective optimization, which is also something we see occur a lot when we solve real-world problems. In the real world, there's not a single thing we want to optimize, but there's usually multiple things we want to optimize. Let's say we have two things that we're equally interested in, then what we want is not one solution, but what we call a Pareto front of optimal trade-off solutions. Now, one solution over here is very good in the first objective, not so good in the second objective. This one's very good in the second objective, not so good in the first objectives. And these trade off how good they are in both objectives. You go from this to this, it increases in objective two, and it becomes a little worse in objective one. What we don't want are these solutions which are not optimal because for every red point, there is a green point that is better in both objectives. Evolutionary algorithms are very good at finding um, the Pareto front or approximations thereof because again, they have this population that they can spread across the Pareto front in a single run, thereby gaining efficiency and solving this problem uh, more efficiently than other methods. Um, now, in order to, of course, have a notion of uh, using EAs is one thing, but how do we get to better EAs? How is this a research line? Well, you need to design philosophy. The one that I use is that effective evolution is actually all about patterns. To become better than just random search or random evolution, you need to see patterns. Now, imagine this is your population. Every horizontal line here is a solution, in this case, a binary solution, 
black dots are zeros and white dots are ones. And we start to do evolution, and you start to see patterns emerge. These patterns are traits that somehow uh, describe how a solution is better than average. Now, in order to make sure that evolution speeds up, we need to detect these patterns, see which patterns actually lead to higher uh, uh, fitness, as we call it, and then repeat those patterns with an above average chance. Only then do we really speed up evolution and go from sometimes exponential scalability to polynomial scalability, to even low order polynomial scalability. And so what we do is we incorporate machine learning to detect these patterns and basically improve the speed of convergence uh, of evolutionary algorithms by orders of magnitude. That is what we call model-based evolutionary algorithms and it's something we have a dedicated research line at CWI that I represent. Um, and has been leading to a world-leading technology by now called GOMEA, which is the Gene Pool Optimal Mixing Evolutionary Algorithm that incorporates in more of a genetic engineering kind of approach uh, merging ideas of local search with uh, uh, basically this population-based stochastic search into this one evolutionary algorithm that basically uses machine learning to get extremely fast optimization. It's a, been proving to be a very successful, so we've made it into a very fast-growing evolutionary uh, algorithm family. We now have different versions for different variable types, real-valued, permutations, discrete Cartesian, um, modern CPU and GPU parallelization to get the most out of the hardware that's available out there today, and ways of leveraging things you may know about your problem to get this algorithm to go even faster. And by doing so, we're able to tackle vastly larger problems now than with classic EAs, better and faster. Not solving problems with tens or hundreds of variables, but millions of variables within the same amount of time. And that now opens the door to completely new possibilities. One of them is looking at ways that we can improve now machine learning techniques. Deep neural networks of deep learning is very popular nowadays. And neural evolution aims to basically evolve neural networks. That's been going around for a long time, but not so much in deep learning yet. Um, so when we do that, actually, um, there's lots of exploitable structure. These deep neural networks are very big, but they're not randomly connected. There's a reason why things are connected the same way and why you have certain parts in the network that, uh, that work the same way. Everyone um, knows about deep neural networks. They're in your mobile phone when you unlock them, when you look at them. Um, and the structure that they use are, there's actually sort of small modules in there that do sensible things like detect an eye or ear or nose or a line. And the way they are connected is sparsely actually. So what you can do is you can evolve these connections to say, okay, for this particular problem, I need these connections, and for this problem, I need these connections, so that for every problem you want to solve that's different from one you've solved before, you actually find the uh, optimal architecture very efficiently, which currently is still very much so a manual labor kind of thing to do. And we've already seen that GOMEA is a state of the art for solving problems with a direct SIG graph way of connecting things. Uh, so that's something we can do also for deep neural networks, and also these modules you can actually evolve separately to things uh, like GP GOMEA, which is a genetic programming variant of GOMEA. You can evolve small cells, little modules, and then combining them using, again, machine learning techniques to tell you what are probably the best combinations. And that's something we're starting to do now uh, and have a few projects running on. That puts us on this path towards really evolutionary intelligence because I just told you that We've been making better EAs, state-of-the-art EAs, by putting machine learning techniques inside of these EAs. But I've also just said, we are now building better learners, automatically finding machine learning techniques that are better than uh, standard techniques through evolution, finding the best possible neural architectures. This is maybe a chicken and egg problem, it looks like, but what I see is synergetic gears of AI innovation, where if we improve this side, we can improve that side and vice versa. And by putting them in a loop, we can get ever more uh, uh, competent and faster evolutionary computation and machine learning, which would really give rise to this notion of evolutionary intelligence. So for the past 16 years at CWI, I've been working on these state-of-the-art RDAs, and now hopefully in the next 16 years, we get to close the loop and really create this evolutionary intelligence. Now, what is that all good for? Is that just academic talk? Uh, actually, there's many EA projects that, uh, that have been going on, uh, currently are going on, uh, and in the future as well, uh, many of them under my supervision. And some of them actually have demonstrable societal impact. And of course, at a memorable event like this, 75 years CDUI, uh, I couldn't um, give a presentation without mentioning, of course, one of our most successful projects on prostate brachytherapy, uh, a, a medical application case 
which has turned out to be multi-award winning, winning awards both from the, from the evolution computation community and the medical domain of radiation oncology for solving a real real world problem. Um, I say that often because it's not just a problem inspired by the real world, it's really solving a problem in the real world, giving the software ultimately in the hands of doctors that they will then use to improve their daily practice. Um, this achievement has also been added to the CBI Hall of Fame, which of course I'm extremely proud of for having been able to lead that project. Um, in a nutshell, what is it about? It's about prostate cancer uh, and a way of treating that with internal radiation treatment. Radiation uh, kills uh, cells. So basically, uh, an ultrasound probe is inserted uh, rectally, after which, under guidance of the ultrasound, catheters are implant implanted through the peritoneal skin piercing the prostate, and through these catheters, which are hollow, a radioactive seed can be sent, which can stop at different locations in these catheters, several hundreds of positions, and how long they should stop there is something you need to optimize in order to get the, to the thing that the clinicians want. Um, and basically, there's a natural trade-off in there. You want to hit those regions where there are tumor cells and you want to stay away from everything that's healthy so you don't cause even more complications. So that's a naturally multi-objective trade-off optimization problem. Yet the current software they use is very manual labor intensive. It doesn't really directly optimize on the things that clinicians evaluate afterward. So using it is very un unintuitive and it takes a long time to get one clinically acceptable plan. Um, the trade-off nature of the problem is hidden because you only get one plan and it's not really clear how uh, changing things leads to an improvement on either covering the tumor or sparing organs at risk. So what we did is we said, okay, let's completely reformulate this optimization problem. Let's solve it in a different way so that we have virtually no manual labor, no parameter tuning anymore, uh, and the outcomes are intuitive. Uh, you can immediately understand what we're looking at. Uh, we did that, but then the optimization model you get is not very nice. It's actually non-convex, non-linear, non-smooth, and multi-objective. And if you use exact methods to solve this optimality, that can take days. Unfortunately, uh, with these catheters inserted, the patient is lying there. You don't want that situation to last very long, so you want this plan to be done within the hour so that the catheters can be taken out again and we can move on as quickly as possible to reduce complications and other kind of movements that have maybe been going on since the planning MRI was made until the, the treatment was actually delivered. Um, so how do we do this? How do we solve this problem? It would be nice if we could, but it's a complex problem. So now we enter our multi-objective real value variant of Gomea, and what we see is we put it in action and it works beautifully. Uh, within three minutes, in high precision mode, higher precision mode than ever was done before, we find an entire trade-off curve. So this is the evolutionary algorithm running actually in real time, this is sped up 10 times, finding this trade-off curve of many, many plans, ranging from plans that are uh, over here, which on this axis shows how much the tumor or the region we, we care about is covered. On this axis, how well we are sparing the organs at risk. So over here, we're doing a great job at sparing, but not at covering. Over here, we're doing a great job at covering, but not so much sparing. And here, this golden corner is where all the plans lie that adhere to clinical protocol. So now you can immediately see um, what is possible for a patient. Can we reach the clinical protocol? And how good are these plans? Uh, what do we have to trade off if I want more coverage? How much uh, am I going to lose in terms of sparing? Um, but presenting that to this, in this way to the doctors in a blinded observer study, we found that the plans were almost always considered clinically more desirable, finding better coverage and sparing for all the plans. So optimizing better in a sense uh, in 98% of the cases in a re retrospective study. And that has led ultimately to uh, creating a version that could be used in the clinic. And on March 17, 2020, Amsterdam UMC started to clinically use what we now call BRIGHT, brachytherapy via artificially intelligent Gomea heuristic-based treatment planning. Of course, a hallmark achievement to go from um, academic, algorithmic uh, research all the way into clinical practice. Um, that's not the end of it. Looking again at the future, we will continue uh, in the Dutch Cancer Society project, KWF. We will now expand to uh, include also cervical cancer. And we have the interest of the nation, everyone basically who does uh, brachytherapy is involved now and wants to be uh, part of a nationwide validation study so we don't only see if this works in Amsterdam but everywhere and there's still so much more to come. Already we're working on so many more projects and we have so many more ideas on how to apply this notion of evolutionary intelligence, improve artificial intelligence in ways and, and solve um, very important society relevant problems. And I would say the future is beyond bright from making new machine learning techniques, finding the best architectures to predict those distributions and, and segment uh, 
things in, in medical images from explainable AI, finding small explainable models that, that, for instance, physicians can use to understand the relationship between treatments and outcomes to different types of tumors, treatment, radiation therapy, and all kinds of medical image processing like deformable medical image registration with both multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and very novel multi-objective neural networks, multi-objective deep learning. There is so much more to come. The future is beyond bright. Of course, this is a beautiful story for me to tell, but it's not just me who's done this. I'm extremely grateful for all the PhD students and postdocs who've done so much of the legwork, all the implementations and running and all of these things, and all my co-authors in general, and of course also all the industry partners and the funding bodies that have believed in the research and continue to fund the research so as to get even better evolutionary intelligence and uh, even uh, more beautiful applications in the real world. And last but not least, of course, thank you, CWI, for the last 16 years, I've been uh, uh, given the room to scientifically uh, ev uh, evolve my own research line uh, that is now GOMEA, and hopefully in the next 16 years, really uh, get to this notion of evolutionary intelligence um, and, and create this beautiful new technology uh, under the roof of CWI. So thank you, CWI, 75 years, happy birthday, on to 100.